Hey everyone, week two of the Queen's funeral with a 13 mile long queue in central London to see the casket. And honestly, at this stage it might just be quicker to put some casters on it and wheel it past everybody along the south bank. But as things go, it's sat in a large plinth in Westminster Hall surrounded by four large candles. And it's therefore a shame that Ronnie Corbett is no longer alive to commentate on the proceedings. Talking about celebrities though, it seems that Philip Schofield was caught trying to queue jump, leading for calls for him to be sacked. So I guess that's perhaps two old queens we won't be hearing from anytime soon. Anyway, this week I thought we'd copy the Sunday newspapers and take a look at a timeline of her reign. 1926, the Queen was born, and unlike you or I, the Queen had two birthdays, so I'm guessing that's because she was born twice, which must have been an especially painful ordeal for her poor mother. In 1947, at the age of 21, she made her first overseas visit to South Africa, and to this day, 21-year-old girls from England continue to go there in gap years and feel the need to broadcast it to the world, albeit via social media. In 1948, the following year, she had a child. Again, something that seems to happen with some of those girls that go in gap years, albeit to far less acclaim. In 1952, Princess Lizzie became Queen Elizabeth II, and the partying led to the end of sweet rationing, which had been in place since the war. Roger Bannister subsequently went on to eat a bar of chocolate and run a four-minute mile off the back of the sugar rush. In the 1960s, she had a few more children, and she met the Beatles, who were pop royalty. The Beatles didn't like paying tax in the UK, so they actually had a lot more in common with the Queen than many would imagine. In the 1970s, she celebrated her Silver Jubilee, and one of the gifts was a London Underground line, which on the map is coloured grey, not silver, because the 1970s were difficult times and money for silver was presumably hard to come by. In the 1980s, her children got married and the longevity of those marriages was immortalised by the government in a piece of performance art known as, quote, sinking the Belgrano. They don't call it the Royal Navy for nothing, you know. In 1992, the Windsor Castle fire was possibly the worst example of a castle being destroyed by smoke until Roy Castle a couple of years later. The Queen referred to 1992 as a, quote, Annus Horribilis, which is the same term that the coroner later used when Stuart Lubbock was fished out of Michael Barrymore's swimming pool. In 1997, Princess Diana died, and then a few years later, the Queen Mother died, sending the Diageo share price through the floor. I remember seeing beef eaters at the Queen Mum's funeral, presumably a nice tribute from the gin company to a long-time customer. In 2005, her son Prince Charles married Camilla, although he declined an offer by the tabloids to go on a honeymoon to Paris. 2012 was possibly the highlight of the Queen's reign. She took part in the Olympic ceremony in which she met James Bond and parachuted out of a helicopter. Blimey. And in 2018, that was the year when she started to take a bit of a slight step back in public duties, all whilst grooming Charles to take over the role which she now subsequently has. You know, she therefore leaves behind a world which is very changed, and also one in which the new king is already in his later years. Not many people get their first job in their 70s. But I guess Charles will sleep soundly with that. What with the rules of homeopathy, the quality of his reign is presumably only greater the less of it there is. So let's raise a small tincture of wine to the new king. See you next week. Please click subscribe.